You're listening to the Cardinal Corner Podcast. So after many, many, many books that I've read now this year that have been nonfiction and self-improvement and of the like, I finally was like, okay, I think it's, I think it's okay. I think I have the self-discipline to read a for fun book. Well, and so I had some, I had some Kindle credit, so it was free <laughs> because of all the stinking books I've been buying for this book club, <laughs> right? And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to pull the trigger. And so I finally am starting to read The Way of Kings, Brandon Sanderson. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, dude. It's crazy. Yeah. I'm only 20 pages in and I'm I'm hooked. Like that's that's all I want to do. I just want to keep reading the book. It's so good. I, I actually felt like it was a bit of a slow start. Really? But it gets wild and the setup is priceless. I mean okay. the payoff is so satisfying. Um just a dang good book. So man. good. Dude. Classic. And Brandon Sanderson's a beast. Like I think oh. when we were doing Why We Sleep, we talked about how he just cranks books out like in the middle of the night. Like yeah. he's a night owl, right? Mm-hmm. That's so wild to me. He, I I swear he writes more than any author out there. I absolutely. I, like, I don't crazy. even know how he does it. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. We'll see how it how it goes. Like I said, this is the first for fun fiction book that I've read in probably a year. So and I, the only reason I don't do it is because I enjoy it so much. Because like I will just do that all day, and it'll be a yeah. problem. So I have to, I have to distance myself from it a little bit. So well, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I mean, we talked about the need for creativity, the need for abstraction in yeah. our innovation episodes. So true, it's important, true. man. I mean, my wife and I, we listen to Harry Potter when we cook. That's oh, kind of my great. fun book. Yeah, that's it's been great. super fun. So I think we're on book two near the end. We're getting close. So that's so I've never good. read them before. So it's been they're fun, man. Oh, they're so good. That's well, we're we're experiencing some new new fantasy at the same time for us. Yeah, so. yeah. Awesome, right. man. You ready, dude? I'm so ready. Let's get let's, into it. Let's jump in. All right, welcome to the Cardinal Corner Podcast. This is the only book club where reading's not required. And today we're talking about the book, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare by Giles Milton. Um, We're going to be talking about our thoughts on the book, some takeaways. We're going to share some of our favorite stories and uh, and just have a blast, man. Just have a good time, hopefully. (laughs) Using the word blast there is great because (laughs) (laughs) if you read this book, holy crap, there's so many explosions. Blasts. (laughs) It's an explosive book. Um, so yeah, quick synopsis again, either for those that read it or who haven't read it. So this book, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, is all about this, um, the secret efforts of guerrilla warfare that were going on during World War II. And some of these events and stories that we're going to tell you were so significant, they turned the tide of the war in real, real ways, like critical ways. And which is crazy because we haven't heard some about it. And um, the author spent a lot of time finding these stories. He had to track down the descendants of these people, find their personal journals. He had to compile all this because me- much of it isn't public information, right? We're talking about the most clandestine secret group probably in the whole war, right? They were so focused and even some of it, most of it wasn't even government sanctioned. Some of it was, some of it wasn't, but we'll get into the stories in a little bit. Just Um, sorry, real quick on that topic of how these are kind of hidden stories. Um, Yeah. I was reading up on Giles Milton and how he kind of compiles information. I mean, he's a legend. He's super talented at his history and retelling these amazing stories. Yeah. But he works at, what was it? The museum, the British museum. Yeah, Um, I think so. And he said he spends days looking at old documents, just reading them, names, all this stuff. He said he'll go, you know, a day or two or three or a week without finding anything interesting. And then he finds like a nugget. He finds something really fascinating. And then he just finds this big rabbit hole of who was this person? Who was this organization? Anyways, that's how he compiled a lot of this information was literally going through the documents and finding secret information that hadn't really been talked about before. And uh, and so yeah, cool telling the stories again and in, in such a wonderful way, and I think that's why the stories are so engaging, right? Because it is stuff that like 
you hadn't heard before. Um, but it's, it's true and it's, um, very impactful. And it made me think a lot about, about our history, about history in general, about record keeping, even lots of good thoughts. I'm sure we'll, we'll get into, uh, but just as a quick forward and disclaimer before we do this episode, um, obviously we know that war and wartime is a very sensitive subject and it's, it's interesting because in the book itself, there's a lot of um, like hard things talked about, but as well as there's hard things, there was levity and joyfulness and I mean, happy times. And um, I think it's the contrast of those two things that makes all of this stuff more meaningful, right? Uh, we can't even comprehend some of the, the terrible, terrible things, the atro- atrocities that happened and currently happen in war. Right. And so as we like discuss these stories, we don't mean to be insensitive towards lives lost or conflict or anything like that. We simply we hope to learn from it. We hope to grow as well as appreciate some of the crazy stuff that has happened. Like this is real stuff. And sometimes you just have to marvel a little bit right at the scale of things, at the ingenuity, the sacrifice, everything that goes into winning a terrible terrible war right where in war nobody really wins right lots of lives lost lots of terrible um terrible things happening so just wanted to to put that out there you know as we as we get into that but having said that the book is enjoyable because it views all of this through the lens of the lenses of a few people right just like mainly six head guys that we'll we'll name in a second um but it it puts a real human perspective on the behind the scenes behind the secret organization. Right. So, well, I, I love the disclaimer and it's important to remember that we're learning as well. Like we're not experts. (laughs) We're learning from an expert and we're like, we've learned a lot about Winston Churchill lately because Mm -hmm. we posted an episode about him and there were a lot of people in our comments, uh, upset, uh, because we didn't acknowledge some of the things that he didn't do uh didn't do good at at all right and yeah massive failures in his career we um, talked about the good and there was also bad right like yes he did, he did some bad things we didn't happen to talk about them so none of these people were putting them on a pedestal like they are perfect yeah people and only did good things right like these are humans right we're all we're all talking yeah. about just imperfect and, and it's important to remember the context we're talking we're celebrating we're celebrating a win We're celebrating the success of SOE. We're celebrating the success of this Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. So, yeah, we have to acknowledge, hey, none of these guys were perfect. Lots of mistakes were made. War is full of mistakes and just, uh, yeah. Tragedy and evil and all the bad things too, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. However we celebrate the goodness, we celebrate the wins, we celebrate bravery and success. So... I think that's a good preface right for this yeah. this conversation because yeah what a, what a great thought from you on on that disclaimer <laughs> thank you thank you so but but dang it are we going to talk about some cool stories today like heck yeah we have some crazy crazy things to talk about and if you've read the book this will be a great hopefully something to cement these stories in your mind because these are like fun it's just fun stuff to talk about um and then for people that didn't read the book this will be your cliff notes right this is how you can you can hear these these stories so but let's let's get into talking about some of our favorite things yeah 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 i wanted to know what's your what what hooked you about the book what was your biggest uh, biggest favorite greatest laughiest thing <laughs> sure sure so i mentioned story already um but the main guy I, I mean i'd consider him the main guy right colin gubbins um kind of like big the, gubs the pioneer <laughs> the big gubs he's the pioneer <laughs> of this group um worked up in the ranks of the the military eventually and and really was a driving force behind this ministry of ungentlemanly warfare one thing that i really re- learned to respect about him was his dedication to this type of warfare in the midst of all the terribleness right he was very focused on the fact that hey, listen, the Germans need to be stopped. Like, they were this close from taking over the world. He knew that, right? He he wanted to stop them. We needed, we needed to stop them. 
And he said he wanted to save lives, actually. He's like throwing more men at this problem, dropping more people just down to fight and into more gunfire is sometimes is not the most effective way. Um, and so he had to sell the idea of guerrilla warfare to a lot of his higher ups very often. And they they often like just disrespected him. They're like, you're an idiot. Like this is high risk, low reward is what they were saying. How am I supposed to dedicate scarce resources to the stuff that I don't know is going to pay off? But Gubbins was so committed to this because he knew it worked. He'd seen it worked before, even earlier on in the war. And he was like, this will save lives if we only send a small group, just a small, very skilled, a very specialized group of people to cause confusion and mayhem amongst the, the enemy. That will save lives because we're not just throwing more, more bodies at the problem. So that was one of my favorite things and what sold me on this book, because that's all the book is about, right? I've heard the stories of the major conflicts, the battles and things like that, but I hadn't heard these stories of these unique extremely talented groups of of men so that was what hooked me what about you what what hooked you man well i love your thoughts and i yeah i'm an american i'll be honest i'm from the u.s of a baby you're not lying you know? you're not lying that you're from the u.s of a <laughs> uh-huh and so uh i was i mean i'm incredibly unfamiliar with british culture especially like historical british culture yeah. And I think Giles Milton nailed it, man. I think he really conveyed it well. And maybe the audiobook helped me because I heard him with his accent, what I think is an accent, uh, because, you know, I'm from South Kakalaki and I'm <laughs> hearing some guy pronounce words funny, but it, he really injected the culture well. And I love the title, Ungentlemanly Warfare, because a lot of the opposition to Big Gubbs, right? Colin Gubbins, our boy, is it was ungentlemanly. And the British culture, at least from what I've read, was being a gentleman was a really important part of their society, being uh, respected and being respectful. And uh, so then here comes this man, and he says, "I want to hit him where it hurts. I yeah. want to, I want to do the unspeakable. I want to trick and manipulate and uh, distract." And uh, that was very uh, different from what they were familiar with. And I. I'm really fascinated by Churchill's uh, willingness to adopt that, right? He's this leader, this man in power, and he says, wait a minute, there's something to this guy who wants to just put bombs everywhere secretly and wants to sneak in at night and wants to just be brutal, right? Um, so yeah, I was really fascinated by that. I loved how Giles Milton conveyed that to me, uh, just someone who's unfamiliar with the culture, and just finding out about how important that was in his role of this war, which is just so funny. I wouldn't have thought about that. Because um, again, American warfare was very, I mean, uh, well, we dropped two bombs. You know what I mean? So sure. just saw Oppenheimer, right? So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, there's a lot. Uh, it, it was different, right? There, Being a gentleman has a different connotation in America. So it's just really fascinating. And yeah, I think Belton really nailed it, really nailed communicating that that aspect yeah. of the story that's such an interesting thought because i i totally agree that like the idea of a gentleman in warfare was very foreign to me even from the get-go right I, people are killing people that's terrible how can that possibly be gentlemanly but there there was a way of doing it gentlemanly and yeah eventually they just reached the conclusion they're like listen we are going to lose this war unless we do some things that may not be the most gentlemanly. We're going to sneak in. We're going to stab these guys in the back. And it's just what needs to happen. Because otherwise, more people are going to die unless we do that. It was it was out of necessity, almost. Um, and the impact that some of those things caused was wild to me. Like, so crazy how, like, four little guys in the right spot at the right time with the right planning. There was so yeah. much planning that went on before these missions took place. Months of planning. But yep. it was so critical. I think that um, another thing that Giles Milton did so well, which is going along with that, is developing the characters of the story. Or or at least communicating these real-life heroes so that these moments feel so remarkable. 
I, I really felt like I understood Colin Gubbins better, you know, and, and it kind of created this underdog story. Here's this group of people who believe they have the key to winning the war and saving the world. And, uh, they have every reason to be opposed or they have so much opposition, um, from everyone and from everything right even from their so own they, government right like their own their allies were like against them absolutely so they're saying you know what i'm gonna do it anyways i'm gonna go make a bomb out of the most random supplies and uh and i'm gonna show it to some leaders and and anyways they they made it work and it was just such a remarkable story i love seeing the characters succeed i love seeing uh, a cecil clark right who was a maniac um, eccentric crazy dude yeah just so out there but in such an effective way in this context <laughs> i know i love the story of him so he uh, for those of you who may not have read the book he's an inventor brilliant inventor and he comes up with these magnificently complicated yet so simple uh detonation devices these bombs um, fuses and all these things for different scenarios. Some were supposed to be underwater, some were timed, whatever. And he starts training these commandos and these these soldiers, basically, to use and deploy these bombs. One of the funniest stories is he's teaching this class in this small room, and he walks in and he has one of his bombs, and he says, in approximately five minutes, this bomb is going to go off. And he turns it on and he sets it on the table. And then he starts walking around and just teaching about the bomb and how to use it. And the students are kind of looking around like, well, uh, okay, um, he's kidding, right? Like, he's got to be kidding. And Giles Milton, as he tells the story, he says that after a minute, you know, people start looking around like, is this guy crazy? After two minutes, they kind of get restless. You know, three minutes goes by, four minutes goes by, the front row starts moving back to the back They're of the room. They're literally taking cover, right? They're, They're like, taking oh cover. They're gosh. Yeah, getting behind the desk. Um, and then finally, Cecil Clark like looks up as if he forgot something, turns to the bomb, picks it up, holds it in his hand, looks at it, and then chucks it out the window. And right as it lands on the lawn, it explodes. Right before five minutes, he threw it out the window. He's a maniac. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly what he was teaching there. Maybe, I don't know, just getting familiar with the weaponry. Who knows? Maybe he just wanted to do it for fun. But it was just such a hilarious moment of understanding this guy's insane and a crucial part of history and w his brilliance led to so many successes but also was just so different than what a conventional mind may think of <laughs> when uh, yeah. trying to accomplish success in a war so it just was so fun seeing these different people their different personalities their different levels of sanity and uh, and how they apply to war <laughs> i know and it, it they did such a good job of talking about that. Like there was probably just as much of the book was about the production of these plans as well as the inventions in these. There were like multiple little secret bases essentially that they had that were just houses. There was like two houses out in the countryside and then there was like an apartment building, just an unseemingly apartment building in the middle of the city, right? Those were their places and no one had any idea that this stuff was going on. Um, but he mentioned... The Giles Milton mentions a couple times how how special it was for these people to be where they were doing the things they were, right? And just the the ridiculousness of it sometimes, like they're blowing up stuff in a swimming pool, right? Or they're just in the beautiful British countryside and they're blowing up these headshot mines and bombs <laughs> and all this stuff, and it just seems like a kind of chaos that's organized and deliberate but chaos still right and it was needed to make the the things that they created in these at the furs i think was one of them right and then the, mm -hmm. what was the other one um was it baker street was that the name of the street where the apartment was i on? think so yeah yeah, yeah. The, the specific names of these little locations escape me but they each had their own little personalities almost right it was like yep. hey can you send me some of those things and then hey can you send me some of those <laughs> explosives and just wild just crazy stuff yep. so um well before we get into the uh stories do we want to i have a i have a follower insight 
from somebody that listens to the podcast. So, heck yeah. Yeah, let's ready? hear it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is from Josh, and he sent me quite the long thing. Um, very good. I'm only going to cover a couple of the, the points here. Um, the first thing that he mentioned, he says, civilians were involved so much more than I would have thought. I mean, civilians were involved almost haphazardly, essentially for how top secret the project was. Random phone calls and friendly connections quickly turned into military positions and a pot shop project that changed their lives, right? Um, the next thing he says is that the inventions and supply chains were very homebrew at times. And I think it shows how important being grateful for the resources at your disposal is. He says, using condoms for airtight seals, using candies as fuses, and testing limpet mines in a public pool. None of this was like officially authorized. Somebody <laughs> just said, I'm working for the government and tested all these weird contraptions in the public pool. And when they couldn't find enough condoms or candies to build the bombs, they, they didn't say, well, we're going to move on to the next thing, right? We've matured beyond these basic ingredients. <laughs> they said, no, we are going to start manu... Or they said, we're not going to start manufacturing ourselves. They went straight to the manufacturers of the condoms, of the candies, and got bulk orders just so they could build <laughs> their inventions. And this was at the necessity of multiple armies, like multiple governments ordering by the millions these inventions. Little did they know that they were being scrapped together with, with everyday items, right? So um, next thing that Josh says, um, he says, even with all the resources and intense training at your disposal, you need people to get things done. And you have to be ready to sacrifice it all. What a thought. I really like that one. What do you think about that one? <laughs> oh, it's, I mean, it's so beautiful. Um, yeah, despite, you, you could have everything in the world, right? But even if you had everything in the world, um, sacrificing your time and your life still is necessary. Even for everything. Like, this isn't even just a war principle, right? This is... And when I say sacrifice your life, I don't mean life or death. I mean your livelihood, right? Yeah. Um, so it still applies. I mean, and it's such a beautiful thought. Um, yeah, if you want to get things done, you still have to make a sacrifice. Yeah. Love it. And then the last thing here that, that Josh said, and this one's a little funny to me because I know Josh and he's a little bit of a workaholic. Uh, but he <laughs> says, burnout is real and intense relaxation, partying, and recharging are all important for extreme schedules. It's far better to delegate and delay than to accidentally dismiss. And then he goes on to talk about how they focused on having some form of fun, right? Before they would send operators off into their secret missions, they would take them out to dinner and do a movie night, right? They had dances. They had all sorts of activities because they were working 16-hour days. And then there was even one guy that replaced another guy who used to work 16 hour days. I can't remember who it was. If it was, it wasn't Cecil Clark, was it? It was, I think it was the oh, other guy. Oh, I'm like on the specific name as there's well. There's a lot of names in this book. There are a lot of names. <laughs> but anyway, there was a workaholic guy. He got replaced by another guy. And this guy came in and he was like, this is not effective. I'm not going to work this much because I know how to work smarter, not harder. Yes. Right? So there's definitely a lesson to be learned there. Yeah. Burnout is brutal. Oh, yeah. I, I attribute that to a lot of my failures in my professional career, especially is like uh, not realizing that more work doesn't mean better work. Um, uh, better work comes from better strategy, better planning, uh, better efficiency, things like that. So uh, really, really fascinating principle here. Um, yeah, it's, I love it. Love it. So thanks, Josh, for sending that to me. Um, if you ever have insights as you're reading these books, make sure you send them to us, right? We're, we're going to keep reaching out to people that listen and, and ask. Um, one of the cool things that Josh told me about this when I asked him for this feedback, he said, I had a really good time sitting down and actually thinking about what I read for just a couple of minutes. It really made him think not only how he could apply those things to his life, but it helped him retain it better and remember it better. So that was something that he told me. And I was like, dude, that's the point of all this stuff. You know, that's why we love talking about books. That's why we do Cardinal Corner. Um, so, he, yeah. I mean, this is, is this not like a prime example of why we started the club? Yeah, that's it. It's, it's like, like the only reason we started the club. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It's like, let's read a random book on some moment of history and let's learn about ourselves from it. 
let's learn how to be better friends, better employees, better business owners, better husbands. And uh, anyways, what a what a wonderful example. But his name's Josh. Josh. Yep. Josh, we love you. Good job. <laughs> what a man. What a guy. What a guy. He is that guy. He, he is, is that guy. guy for reals. All right. Are you ready to get into stories, dude? Or do you have anything else to add? No, I'm ready. I've been prepping my soul for this. I love the stories, man. I want to okay. hear your your side of things here. Okay. So we're going to tell three stories, I think, from the book. Um, so I'll, I'll start here with one. And again, here's the other disclaimer is that we're probably going to get some of this crap wrong. Like we're probably going <laughs> to tell you names and places and people that may not be 100% accurate because we learned a ton. So if you want the actual dates, if you want the actual names, just go read the book. It's so good. Absolutely. So, but let's get on to the story number one. So story number I will one. Actually, you know oh, what? Yeah. I'm so sorry. No, tell me. Put the brakes. One one other thought. Go yes. watch videos on these missions. Oh, yeah. Um, we'll tell you the name of the operation. And just if you look it up, there's going to be a 5, 10, 15 minute video about them. Super incredible. Like some of the stories I was so fascinated by, I would just look it up. And I'd find even more interesting details. And so some of the details that we share may even be from more research that we did on our own. So Yeah, I know. And some of these things need visuals too. I actually had to go and look up what some of these devices looked like. Mm -hmm. And it really made the book more alive to me. I didn't realize that there was going to be pictures at the end. Like there's, And you probably didn't even know because you read the audiobook. Yeah. But there's like a whole section at the back of the book with pictures, like of all the people that it talks about, all the operations. Very good. So highly wow. recommend that. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. All right. So we're going to start out here. First story. Story number one is called Operation Gunnerside. And this operation was to take place in Norway. Um, so Germany took over Norway pretty early on in the war. And there was a specific compound that they had control of. And um, later on in the war, once the atomic weapons were starting to be developed in all these different countries, like everyone kind of started around the same time attempting to build the atom bomb and Germany was trying, right? Like that was, they, they knew that if they hit it, it was kind of a race to see who could win the war. Uh, and there was an ingredient in making a bomb, an atom bomb. I don't know how this works called heavy water, which I thought was a little funny. <laughs> uh, but apparently heavy water was needed in the, the process of making the radioactive material, as I understand. So the the place was called Norsk Hydro, okay? And if I can paint you this picture, this compound was something out of a supervillain movie, a superhero movie or something, man. So it was literally on top of a bluff. So cliffs all around each side with the compound on top a single bridge from the mountain to the bluff. So it's like a, almost like a moat, right? But there's no water. It's like just cliffs. Please and tell me it was a rope bridge that like snapped and someone's like swinging. It honestly could have been as far as I know. <laughs> I, all they said it was it was a bridge and it was heavily guarded, right? So it's like one gate, guns everywhere, crazy impossible to get into the one entry, right? And it's in Norway, so it's freezing cold and blizzards all the time. So this is what they did. You know, their goal was to go in and destroy not only the equipment used to make this heavy water, but the heavy water supplies themselves to get rid of it. Because if they don't have that, they can't make the bomb. So they, the operators had to, the operatives had to do a blind drop into freezing Arctic terrain. They couldn't see where they were landing. They just, it was shot in the dark. When they landed, they lost a crate of key supplies that was their sleeping and their trekking equipment, as well as their food for the first oh. five days of survival in a literal Arctic wasteland. They lost it, right? And they searched and searched and searched, and eventually, somehow in the darkness, they found it stuck into a frozen lake, just crashed into the lake, right? Uh, after that, they met up with the squad that had been there previously. They had dropped, and they had been surviving for, I think it was four months. They'd been eating Arctic moss, and occasionally a reindeer would bless them with its presence, and they would be able to get some actual oh my meat gosh. and protein. Um, so, uh, Have what's... you seen the show Alone? Yes. Yes, That's man. what I'm thinking of. That's all I'm thinking of is just how brutal it is to survive in the wilderness 
and these these guys are prepared on the show but imagine oh, not yeah. having supplies i mean that's so brutal yeah all of this again is happening after like six months of prep where they go and they physically train they mentally train i specifically remember reading that they these guys that were in this situation said that their mental training was key because yeah. they were in snowy cold darkness for weeks the the second group was there for you know just a couple weeks i think but the first group was there for months just waiting for these guys after the operation was was greenlit so crazy right so eventually they they group up they got a ton of equipment they don't know what's going to happen um beforehand though they had built an exact replica of this compound in england because they had some insiders and so they were able to literally build it foot by foot exactly what it would be so these operatives knew what their layout was going to be by having been there but not having been there <laughs> so the the amount of prep crazy wow. and so what they had to do to get into this compound is they they climbed down one side of you know the the mountain got to the bottom of this bluff they were very lucky and fortunate because there was actually an ice bridge that formed so they didn't have to cross in the water they were able to walk over the top but they had no idea if it was going to break they didn't know if they were going to make it but they did they climbed up the side of this icy cliff in the dead of night, as always, because this all this stuff happens at night, right? Like, you have to do it. And so they climb up. Somehow, their entire squad makes it inside unseen. They plant their bombs around without literally being seen by anybody. I think they, they got seen by one guy that they assumed was going to be there. And um, he didn't put up a fight at all. They basically just held him at gunpoint, and he let him do what they were going to do. They set the mines to explode right after they set them to explode. The one guy that they had at gunpoint was like, hey, I left my glasses in the other room. Can I go grab them? They're really hard to get in Norway. He's like, if you blow up, up I will not be able to see. <laughs> and so they're like, yeah, man, go grab your glasses. They weren't going to just kill him in cold blood, right? Because he was very cooperative. So Very anyway, gentlemanly. <laughs> very gentlemanly. This was one of the more gentlemanly acts of warfare. Um, so they set the bombs, blew everything up. And they had planned these specific types of explosions so that they would be they would explode on the inside and not be detected on the outside as much. They still expected them to hear because it's an explosion, but they were able to get out without anybody even knowing that they had just blown up all this critical heavy water for the atom bomb development. And it wasn't until they had climbed down the cliff, across the river, and then up the other cliff, that was the moment that the Germans finally realized that something had gone wrong. And they set off the air raid, you know, sirens like, somebody's bombing us. They had no idea that people had gone in and out completely under their noses. 100% um, success of a mission was a crazy feat of discipline and strength and preparation. The planning that went into this one was, was something that stood out to me. And it made me think about how important planning is for my life and all the critical things that I need to do. Classic saying, if you fail to plan... You plan to fail, right? Uh, did, I, did I butcher the, this saying? I remember last, last episode I said, uh, innovation is the mother, or no, necessity is the mother of innovation. I know it's invention, all right? I messed, <laughs> I screwed up the thing. My dad was giving me flag for that. He was like, yeah, you, you said the <laughs> quote wrong. So hopefully I got that uh, one right. I but think you got it right. Anyway, Germans did not make the atom bomb. GG's, you know, we win. Crazy. We win. I, I mean- that first of all, that would have been catastrophic if they made the bomb first. Yeah, I cannot even imagine what life would have been like. Yeah, there was some divine intervention there. Like those guys climbing that cliff had the help of the good Lord. Like surely, <laughs> like they, they that that would is that would have been awful. Um, and I don't know what the timeline was, how advanced the Germans had gotten, but yeah, I just can't even imagine. Hard to know. And, and I remember, didn't that wasn't there still some water, heavy water? Is that what it's called? Oh yeah, that's true. I forgot to mention that. So yeah, there was still reserves that they had outside of that. They so they found out about the extra. Um, I want to say it was like yeah, thirty six hundred gallons. So they still had a, a big amount that was not held at this compound. The mission was so successful that one of the guys, um, his name was Newt Halkleed or Halkill. Newt. Newt. What a what a name. So Newt was, he was one of the ones that was on this operation. 
and he opted to stay in Norway rather than escaping back to England just so he could finish the job. This wasn't even part of the original plans. <laughs> this guy on his own, of his own volition just went and found the transported heavy water, found out when it was going to be crossing a river, and he planted some explosives on the barge to explode while it was in the middle of the river. So he sunk the heavy water oh into a river gosh. and... I guess it was at that point that it was a 100% success because they literally got rid of every last drop of this stuff. So talk about seeing it through to the end, man. <laughs> Newt, man. You can't go wrong with Newt. What a baller. <laughs> I mean, imagine you're preparing for a mission that could kill you, uh, could be the end of your life, and you succeed, and the rescue planes or boats or however they escaped uh, are here and it's uh, you know free will and freedom forever and yeah he did it glory he and gone. fame is, is yeah. right there for you but he decided to stay i mean i love that guy i love new <laughs> awesome what a what a man so yeah that's so that's for number one that's operation gunner side so let's one one connection between that story and the story i'm about to tell that i think is so funny is they always the enemies always think it was uh, bombs dropped from planes. Yeah, because that was how that's you how did effective, things, right? That's yeah. that's how that's what Germany did, right? Whenever they were going to blow something up, they just sent their their planes. They'd blow up the thing and in and out, and it was expensive, and you know it was very common to do that. And I think that was the brilliance of this ministry of ungentlemanly warfare is they did the damage of bombers with just a couple of dudes and some some condoms <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and the so. confusion that it caused on top of that i think i remember in the book it talked about how the confusion and the mayhem is one of the most valuable commodities in guerrilla warfare because it, it delays things right it puts a, it puts things behind it um ca causes even like a chain reaction of rabbit holes where they're like oh it was this these guys did it no these guys yep. did it and they're chasing chasing rabbits right and no chance that they're figuring this stuff out yep and i think this story has a perfect example of that right here so yeah i'll hit jump into it. it hit me with it i'm ready get ready so um this one's called gubbins pirates or operation postmaster and this one blew my mind it was so exciting Literally like a movie. They sh really should make a movie out of this mission alone. It was so crazy. So basically, um, Colin Gubbins and Gus March Phillips have this plan to stop the hunting of U-boats or, or to interrupt that whole battle because U-boats were a big part of the war. Um, but just after they arrived in, uh, it was West Africa, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they realized that there was another opportunity that might be a little juicier, might be a little better. So so they actually changed their mission. And, and this opportunity was there were these three ships. Um, the, the oh, I'm going to butcher this. The Chesa de Asta. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Um, which was the you biggest You have to say it threat. like in Italian. Sorry. You have to say it like, do you de, de Asta. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, so that one was the biggest threat because... That one had, they had discovered, had radio communication on. So they knew that if they didn't take that one out first, there could be some radio uh, communications about the Allied forces and things like that. Um, and it also had heavier we weaponry. Um, and it was also joined by two, I think, smaller ships, the Lacomba and the Bur Burundi, Burundi. I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, bear the, with two, me there. the two German boats, right? So the one was Italian exactly. and then the two German ones. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, they were all anchored at the small islands. And the the reason that this was important was because that island had a very pro-Nazi Spanish governor on there. And he was using information of passing ships and things like that to, to inform uh, Nazi Germany and tell them, hey, here's where this, um, you know, British ship is going, X, Y, Z, whatever. Uh, so they were like, if we can take these ships out, uh, or even steal them, you know, foreshadowing, <laughs> uh, then then that would totally ruin their plan. So here's this, the, here's where it all starts. Um, uh, they they plan to go in, strike in the night, and get out quickly. So what they do is they commandeer these two tugboats. 
called the Vulcan and the Nuneaton. Nuneaton, right? I think so. Yeah. Nun- okay. Yeah, the Nuneaton. Little tugboats um, that are kind of unassuming. I think they actually commandeered them from civilians for the sake of the mission. And they were getting the, the mission ready. They got bombs and weaponry on these tugboats um, and, you know, outfitted them for a mission. But the problem was they met some opposition. There was a uh, British general or a general officer named George Gifford. Uh, uh, Cl- not Clifford, the big red dog, but Gifford, the British general. <laughs> yeah, it's common misconception there. Yeah. Um, and he, he said no way to this mission. He got word of it and said, you're going to try to take two tugboats and steal three ships uh, yeah, you know, with, with uh, enemies all on the coast and all on that, that harbor. No way. Way too risky. He, he shut down the mission. It was really disruptive. But Churchill came in. And Churchill had been briefed on the mission throughout the whole planning of it. And he said, this is too good to to pass up i mean the the benefits would far outweigh the risks and they he also argued it's inevitable the conflict here is inevitable let's just try to do it with some guerrilla warfare so churchill came clutch for for gubbins and company and and they start the mission now what they did is they first had one of their commandos richard lippett i think that was his last name lippett he went and he got a job undercover at the shipping company there and he just started gathering information and he started to find out the personality and the character traits of the people that were working on these ships. And he found out that the people specifically that worked on the Italian ship, uh, they loved to party, right? They loved drinking. They loved going out at night. So he started pretending to be a party animal and he got their attention and befriended them and said, oh yeah, man, I love to drink. I Let's go out. Started going out with them at night and things like that. Little did they know he's actually you know, British intelligence and an SOE operative, and he's uh, planning, right? So he gets to know them better. What they do is they see in the future, there's going to be a night with a waning moon. So it's going to be super dark. And I think there was a lights out um, policy or something for the wartime. Um, So Lippet plans a, a dinner party with extra, extra alcohol on that night. And so the, they get the tugboats ready. And on that night, Tippett throws this party, gets everyone drunk. And I think even more people came than he expected. I think officers and uh, of the, the Italian and the German ships came, left the ship. Um, I'm not sure it's, uh, they have specifics on how many people were on the ships, but a majority came to party, which is just hilarious. So on this night, the party is thrown, everyone gets drunk and in comes these two little tugboats they turn off the lights there's no moonlight so it's pitch black you cannot see these little tugboats that are coasting in um and what happens is they launch little rowboats off with uh commandos to go blow up the chains and the anchors and also cause some distractions on the harbor and on the docks and and begin taking these ships and one of the interesting stories that i read was uh, a man named Ro- uh, Graham Hayes, sorry, Graham, Lieutenant Graham Hayes, was on one of these boats rowing up to the Italian one, the Duchess, uh, the Duchess, uh, oh, what's the? Duchess, uh, the Duchess, oh, yeah. the, the, the Osta. That one. Uh, <laughs> so he's rowing up to it and he sees a guard, a German guard, lean over the edge and spots him and says, hey, uh, stop right there. What are you doing? He's got a Tommy gun to his side hidden in this little boat, right? And he looks up and he, he knows that if he shoots at this man, if he takes fire on him, then that's their gig is up, right? So using his broken German, he convinces this guy that he has a letter for the captain of the ship. So this guy's like, oh, well, why didn't you just say so? And helps them up, right? So helps these, these uh, commandos up onto the ship. And the moment they get up there, they pull their guns out and they take them hostage. And they actually make them jump overboard. Before he can, uh, you know, fire any alarms or anything like that. Yeah. So funny. And uh, and then while they're on the ship, they go, they plant bombs on the anchors, on the chains. Um, they start blowing the chains up. The good thing is some of these boats are connected by ropes, um, so which makes it easier. Um, but obviously, uh, there's an explosion, right? 
So everyone's like looking around, really confused at the explosion that just happened. And uh, they they run to the to the shore and look out what the heck is happening. And they see three of these massive ships being tugged away by little tugboats. And they don't know what to do because they think that air, uh, yeah, air airplanes have dropped bombs on these ships and have taken them, right? And they don't turn on the lights because they fear that that'll uh, give a better target for these bombers, right? So they don't even try to stop them because they're afraid of bombers. Um, and they had no idea it was actually some guys on two little tugboats, right? Uh, ends up taking all three of, sh all of the ships, uh, steal them, completely steal them, and the drunk people come out and they're too uh, out of their minds and they're too uh, inebriated to understand what's really going on and they are completely helpless in, in stopping the mission. So, massive success. Later on, the, um, not Clifford, Gifford, Sergeant Gifford or Sir Gifford, the, the officer, um, actually apologized to Colin Gubbins, Colin Gubbins personally, and said, I'm sorry that I uh, denied you. I hope I can be on your side in future missions. So, massive success, hilarious, oh, cool. ironic, and just fun, man. Just big, big success there. Didn't the, uh, didn't the uh, captain of the ship, he like woke up? Right, he was like, "Where is my boat?" <laughs> he was <Yeah>. like, <laughs> "What the heck happened to my boat?" And then yep. he's hung over. He's he's just so confused. Walks outside. All three boats are gone. And r yep. remind me, was this the one where there was like a ton of aftermath with it? Right, like they, the Germans, literally had no clue who did it. They thought yes. it could have been pirates. They thought it could have been France. They even thought it could have been Germans. One of the Germans said this act was so good that it only could have possibly been the germans because of how good this heist was, I was like, absolutely oh, the irony there is so good so fun it, it's such a commentary on the power of uh unity of precision of planning i mean these guys against all odds and with no support are doing things that entire countries uh, with with all their resources aren't doing you know yeah um yeah I, I just i love the the irony and the humor of these people looking outside seeing the explosions and shooting in the air at nothing yeah. they're literally shooting in the air at nothing <laughs> they're like i've got to get them i'm gonna get these bombers yeah. there's no one up there man it was some guy on a rowboat who convinced your officer that he had a letter for the captain you know it was so funny um Really, that has, really that has to play story. into like the frustration that Govins felt, right? Why people didn't trust him with these missions, right? It took so long for some of them to get to get greenlit by the higher ups because, like, it's it's you know how could this possibly work? And he's like, look, yeah, maybe there was some risk there, but like we risked three guys' lives or just a, a small group, you know? I I think they had more than three, right? It was like eleven. Yeah. They hired some Nigerians, yeah. I think, to be on their boat with them. Yeah, but they're like. These these guys accomplished such a major thing with no trace left. The the British, you know, to cover their own tracks were like, nah, Germany, I don't know what you're talking about. Like we we're sending people out to try and find out who did this crap. Like we're <laughs> we're trying to figure it out. Uh, I just thought it was so 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 good. fun. So impactful. So dude, thank you for telling that story. So good. Oh, I can. Um, I think we got one more, right? We got one more to finish it up here. And right this at the is end. uh this is a good one. Oh, it's so good. This is the one where you were saying they should make a movie out of it, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, crazy. So I'm trying to remember. I don't think I wrote down what this operation name was. I I think I neglected. It was to do the that. Chariot. The I, Chariot. I think. I think that might be right. Um, operation Chariot or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Or if you look up the Greatest Raid, that's actually what they call it nowadays. Uh, after okay. The, after the fact, because it was the Greatest Raid. It, it was. was okay. Thank you for looking that up because I was like, I, I think I forgot. Sure. That. So, so this one happened. Um, it was the Normandy docks, and I'm going to try to pronounce this name in with in French. It, was, it is in France. Uh, I think it's pronounced Saint Nazaire, or something like that. Sure. Saint Nazaire, as I would say, if I said it, <laughs> not knowing Saint anything Nazir. about where it was. <laughs> so <laughs> it was the only dry dock in the Atlantic with enough equipment and even just big enough to support the Germany's new destroyer called the Tirpitz. Now, this destroyer was so powerful and so big that 
the entire British government was like, we cannot let them operate in the Atlantic. If they operate in the Atlantic, we may lose this war. That's how critical this was. And so eventually they found out, you know, be, that this was the only dry dock big enough to service it. Uh, Germany had occupied France at this point. So they're like, we need to destroy this. Or Hitler won't risk sending this massive boat without having a place that it can park and, you know, get repairs and refuel and all that stuff. Right. So it was critical. Um, they spent a long time searching for a way to, to penetrate this, this dry dock. It seemed impenetrable. They had, they had guns, they had mines, they had everything that you could possibly need to defend this place because the Germans also knew how critical it was that they kept this place safe, um, for this boat, for the Tirpitz. So eventually, uh, this guy, John Hughes Hallett, along with Gubbins, found that if the conditions were perfect, the water would rise enough to where a boat could get right up to the dock gate without going through a side dredged channel, which was usually the, the normal way that a boat would make its way into the dry dock. Um, so they were like, okay, if conditions are perfect, we can just stroll right up to the entrance, essentially. So they formed a plan to ram the case in. Now, a caisson is just a big gate that's essentially a giant boat. So just it's a floating gate that opens and closes that lets people in or keeps them out. So massive structure. And they were going to ram the caisson with an old World War I destroyer filled with explosives. So literally just crashing it in there. So this is where we get into the greatest raid. Um, they said that this bomb needed to have a long and robust delay mechanism thing about all the vibrations and shakiness that's going to happen is you ram a destroyer into a giant concrete floating gate. There's going to be some shaking. And so if it's like, if there's a mechanical fuse, it could unlatch and explode early. And then they just killed all of their own guys. Um, if it's another kind of method that could be easily tampered with and discovered, then maybe the Germans would find it and disable it before the, the bomb explodes. There are so many variables. They were even in the process of developing a fuse for this, but it wasn't quite done. It could not be relied on. So they had to use this thing called the time pencil. And the time pencil was described like this. It was a spring loaded striker held under tension with a piano wire. And then they would pour acid into this little glass container surrounding the piano wire. And then at some point in the future, hopefully around eight hours was their goal. The acid would eat through the piano wire, which would make the, um, the spring loaded striker go, but they really had no way to tell exactly when this thing was going to explode. And so they, they made this big plan. They loaded up the, the destroyer and the whole, all the while they'd been training a small group of gorilla, uh, of gorillas to attack the rest of the docks and just cause mayhem while the main boat, the main destroyer was, you know, waltzing right up to the entrance. Um, so the bomb on board was four and a half Tons. And, and then it was enclosed in steel and cement to cause mass destruction. So they, they encased it with this stuff so that when it exploded, the debris would be sent everywhere, causing mass destruction to this dry dock. So when it went down, they attacked in the dead of night. When the conditions were perfect, they found a day when, when it was going to be right, or I guess a night. Um, the Campbelltown was the name of this old destroyer that they were going to use as the battering ram. And they faked it to look like a Nazi ship that needed repairs just to cause even more confusion, right? Confusion and deception was this guy's bread and butter. So they started going up to it and they were radioing back and forth with the Germans and they were like, hey, what are you doing? And like, oh, we need repairs. So they kept trying to just tell them, hey, we need to come in, we need repairs. Eventually the Germans figured out that this was not the allies, that it was it was their enemy. Um, well, that's a little confusing. It was the allies. It wasn't the Axis, you know, which were their allies. But anyway, um, at some point they realized the ruse was up and they started just unloading on the ship. They were shooting everything at it, trying to, to make it stop. But it kept going, kept going, kept going. And then at 1.34 a.m., it rammed into the case. In, right. Mission accomplished. Right. As long as the bomb explodes at some point, they had a long enough delay because they wanted all their guys to get out or at least as much of those possible unfortunately in this raid there were most of the allies that para parachuted in and, and dropped in they were killed or captured 
only a fourth were able to to escape and come back. Um, but one of the one of the main leaders of this group, he got he got captured. So things had kind of quieted down. They had either killed or captured everybody the Germans had, and now there's this boat just stuck in the casing. And so they round up everybody and they bring them in and start interrogating these guys, right? And so the Germans are interrogating the British guy, and one German intelligence officer said. You people obviously didn't know how hefty that lock gate is. It was really useless to try and smash it with a flimsy destroyer. And as reported, um, as he was saying that to this British officer that he was interrogating, the ground shook with a massive explosion. And two hours late, I think, the the bomb had gone off. Basically, the British had lost hope. They were like, we screwed up. The bomb wasn't going to blow. It was supposed to blow at nine. Didn't go, didn't go, didn't go. And then I think around 11 or so. It finally exploded, causing mass destruction and succeeding the mission. Um, crazy. The the t- the turpits, the boat that they were trying to prevent from entering the Atlantic, never went there. It never could because of the severe amount of, of damage that they did. But man, that just cracks me up. That German intelligence officer <laughs> being like, you losers, you failed. You idiots, what were you thinking? Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Get wrecked. I mean, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. I know. Uh, hilarious. Well, and what's so interesting about the timing as well is Germans actually went into the ship and started searching it for bombs. Yeah. Couldn't find it because they had hit it in the walls and especially heavy on the front end of the ship. Yeah. Um, and so they actually started looking for souvenirs. Uh, I just read this while I was looking at this story, researching it on my own. They, they were like, oh, no bombs in here. They had some... British, uh, you know, kit or people that they had um, taken as prisoners, but they just started looking for knickknacks and British, you know, things, thingamabobs. <laughs> and uh, and so there were actually a ton of German shoulders on the ship when it exploded, which led to a loss of so many German soldiers. Um, so the timing seriously actually ended up being perfect. Yeah. Sadly, they were captured before it went off, but uh, I think it actually caused more damage because it was delayed. Exactly. So crazy the way that that worked out. Um, but yeah, those are our, those are our three favorite stories from this book. There were so many others. I wish we could yeah. cover every single one, right? But there's some crazy ones from the hedgehog being developed, which is a crazy um, type of weapon that goes on a boat that's way better than depth charges. There was the sticky bomb thing where they had to kill the a very high-ranking German officer. Um, they had one shot to, to get it, basically, and they were able to use sticky bombs for it. So, so many more. Got to go read this book. With that, Bobby, what is your recommendation for this book? What do you think about it? Uh, well, it's an amazing book. You can't deny it's an amazing book. Um, so it's absolutely one that you should read add it to the list that's the takeaway here that's our review add it to your list and read it when you can um incredibly motivating and and the biggest takeaway for me was the capacity of human achievement and and when you're reading it by yourself i hope that you realize that there's no blockade there's no wall there's no uh, debilitation that can keep you from succeeding if it's right and if you put all of your heart, might, mind, and soul into it. Um, if it is right, you will succeed. Um, I mean, I'm so inspired by these few guys, these few gentlemen that just really truly believed in their potential and in the potential of their ideas and knew that they could save lives. And so against all odds, they they did. Um, we can do that in our personal lives. We can overcome obstacles. We can be resourceful and use candies and, and whatever's at our disposal to, to succeed and to be happy and to save. And I just am so amazed by these stories. And so if you need that, if you need that hope and that faith and that self-efficacy, please read this book. Um, it's, it's a really fun one. So I definitely add it to the list. That's, that's the, that's the, the recommendation there. Love it, man. I would agree with you, if, especially if you're into history, this one is, is definitely one that you should read. Um, we can't recommend it enough. I, I personally learned a ton about 
discipline and executing with exactness. I know that's a big thing in the military. I have some friends that are in the military and the type of discipline that they, they learn is uh, very respectable. And it's the type that I try to do in my daily life. But I, compared to these guys, man, I'm a loser. Like these crazy <laughs> British operatives that were, you know, put in these insane conditions doing the most impossible tasks, they were such exemplary people in their field, right? They, they trusted the plan. They followed the plan. They, when the plan went bad, they improvised and used their skills. They relied on their their training, all that good stuff, right? All great things that, that we can learn to trust ourselves from the things that we've trained to be diligent in developing the things that we need to to learn and then sticking to that, sticking to your guns when it when it matters. So um, I love and, that recommendation and I love, I love your thoughts on that too. Thank you. Uh, and... And planning, plan, plan. <laughs> make a plan. Seriously, make a plan. If you want something, plan to achieve it. And, and write it down. Dang it, these guys were you... not just talking about these plans. <laughs> they were they were writing this stuff down. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, anything is possible. You can you can develop a bomb that works underwater. You can develop a bomb that uses piano wire. And Unless acid. that's illegal, then don't do that. <laughs> I'm pretty yeah, sure okay. that's illegal. If you're, yeah, I'm speaking it, in metaphors. It, yeah, metaphorically, build a bomb. <laughs> yeah, anything is possible. Please believe in that. I seriously, I mean, I, I'm, and a part of me is saying this to myself. True. Please, Robert, <laughs> believe that that you can accomplish anything. And uh, another last thought. I, I know we've been a little wordy at the end here, but just. I am so humbled by their willingness to sacrifice their life for the world. There is no greater love. There is no greater humility. There's no greater charity. Um, I, and I feel it in my soul at this very moment. As we've been talking about it, I'm, I'm just so grateful that they would do that for me. And they don't know me, and they don't know that this affected me, but it did. It yeah. did affect me. And it allowed me to sit here and talk about them yeah. on a computer, you know? Exactly. Um, I'm just so grateful for them and their sacrifice, so grateful for their love, whether they felt that it was love or not, or whatever their motivation was, it was love. And and I, I hope I can become like that. I hope I can adopt that and adopt that willingness. It's just so, so inspiring. I love, I love that, man. What, what a note to end it on. So thank you for sharing that. Um, normally, we'd announce the next book here. Uh, we have so many options that we have not been able to pick one yet. So make sure you're following us on Instagram, YouTube, join our Discord if you want. Anywhere, just make sure you're following us so that when we announce this next book, you're you're in the know. Um, I hope it's another good one. I feel like we're four for four. So uh, it's going really well. We appreciate everybody that listens and um, listens to us just ramble on about this stuff. But we hope you learned something. So um thanks for listening all the way through uh, again make sure you're following us um and especially on the podcast platforms as well make sure that you have a great week make sure that you learn something from this and make sure you implement it in your life and above all else we freaking love you thanks for being with us 